Good to see you again, brothers and sisters. What a joy it is to find time gathered together for this one desire, the desire to study the Word of God. Before we rush into our study, let us recall the main lessons we learned during our last Bible study. First, we were basically looking at several parables. Jesus told the parable of the sower as a pronouncement and then the exposition that follows. This is followed by other parables like the candle and the bushel, another parable on the mystery of seed, its growth and harvest later, and the comparison of the kingdom of God to a grain of mustard seed. All things were spoken in parables, which were later explained to the disciples if they do not grasp their meaning. Finally, we were looking at one of the greatest miracles in the Gospels, the calming of the storm. While Jesus was fast asleep, the wind and the storm battered against the small boat that the disciples and their master were traveling with. Matter of fact, the disciples despair for their lives as their master awoke and silenced the wind and calmed the sea. They were filled with fear at the suddenness of the calm that they exclaimed, what manner of man is this? that even the wind and the wave obey him. Meanwhile, on Jesus' part, he chided them for their fearful little hearts, so devoid of faith. Dear friends, we shall continue to witness many miracles in our study even today, and I pray that God would increase your faith as we journey through Mark chapter 5. We come now to one of the most important chapters in the Gospel of Mark. I'm sure some of you are smiling now because I think I say that about every chapter we study. Well, every chapter is the most important chapter when you are studying it. But this one is important because the Gospel of Mark is the Gospel of action. There are more of the miracles given in this Gospel than in any other. And in this chapter there are three outstanding miracles related to one another. They could be performed only by the hand of the omnipotent God. That is why I think this is a remarkable chapter. Let me say a word about demon possession. We promised on several occasions in Matthew and when we began Mark, we said that we'd have something a little more detailed to say concerning demon possession. Now this is the place. In Mark chapter 5, in verse 1, it says they crossed the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Our Lord had taught on the other side and had given them parables. He was weary and so he crossed the sea. The Gadasarenes were the inhabitants of Gadara. And this is the land that was given to the tribe of Gad on the east side of the Jordan River. Remember, Gad chose the wrong side of the Jordan. They were the ones who stayed on the east side and now we find them in the pig business. You see, when you start away from God, you just keep going away from Him. But when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet Him. He's a man, a human being. Note that first of all and write it down. He is in a desperate condition, but he is still a man. That is what the Lord Jesus saw, a man. In spite of his condition, Jesus saw the man. Studying his conduct suggests that the man was a maniac. Notice what it says about him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. This is a desperate case of a man possessed with an unclean spirit. He dwelt, which means he settled down among the tombs. This is where he lived. This was his ghetto. The tombs were unclean places. The dead were there, and sometimes the bodies were exposed. He no longer enjoyed the society of normal people, but he lived among the dead. We find from Matthew 
that there was another man, but Mark and Luke center on this one. We gather that the man was no companion to this man, nor, of course, were the dead any companion to him. He was alone. Yet we are told that he possessed superhuman power, so that he could not be bound. Just because a man demonstrates power which is supernatural does not prove that God gave it to him. This case is a very typical example. He was a wild man. No one could confine him. He was miserable. He suffered great physical harm which he inflicted on himself. He was a creature of pathos and pity. And on the human plane, he is a hopeless case. He's inarticulate and just crying out. What an awful condition. And all due to demon possession. Verse 6 says, When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of Jesus. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. It was the man who worshipped him, not the demon. He was afraid of Jesus. He suffered from what I suppose could be called spiritual schizophrenia, a split personality. Sometimes it is the man and sometimes it is the demon when they spoke. In verse 7, it literally says, What is there to to thee and me. That is, what have we in common? This poor man possessed by demons. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. The answer of this man is baffling, but it's not bad grammar. He says, My name is, indicating that the man was trying to speak. But then the demons take over and they say, We are many. Verse 10 And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs were feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were all drowned. There is a tremendous occurrence presented to us here. The demons made a very peculiar request. They preferred swines to the abyss. Now a few things about demon possessions. Perhaps if you have a pencil or some writing instrument, you would like to make note of these things. First of all, not only Mark but all the scriptures bear definite witness to the reality of demons. For those who accept the authority of scripture, there must be an acceptance of the reality of demons. Secondly, they were especially evident during the ministry of Jesus, but of course were not confined to that period. By the way, we are living in a day right now when there is a resurgence and a manifestation of demonism again. Many illustrations of this could be given. Number three, for some strange reason, they seek to indwell humans. They seek to manifest their evil nature through human beings. They are extremely restless. This description is clear. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places. Seeking rest and finding none, he saith, I will return to my house whence I came out. That's found in Luke chapter 11 and verse 24. Is this not the characteristic of all evil, even evil men? There is a restlessness of seeking expression of the evil nature. Good spirits never seek to take possession of men. The Holy Spirit is the one exception. And he only indwells believers. But as truly as he indwells believers, so demons can possess the unsaved. Demons cannot possess the saved. 
we are told that greater is he that is in us, that is the Holy Spirit, than the one who is in the world, which is Satan. That's in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. Therefore, a child of God cannot be demon-possessed. Number 4. In this incident, the demons would rather go into the herd of swine than the abyss. Now that is an interesting note that we must remember. Number 5. They should be called demons and not devils. There is only one devil. Our translation is faulty here. They are called unclean spirits because of their nature. Scripture does not give us, sixthly, the origin of demons. Anything I could say today would be highly speculative. Number seven, there seems to be many of them. Number eight, they are under the control of Satan himself. Now I said I would not speculate, but here I go. I am of the opinion that when Satan fell, these were the angels that followed him. Now having said that, let's not say any more. Number nine. Their purpose is the final undoing of humans. They are certainly working on Satan's program. And number 10. There are present day examples of demon possession. We have Satan worship all around us. I think that Satan is prepared to give reality to those who worship him. The all important question is, what kind of reality do they find in him? Number 11. The Lord Jesus Christ has power over demons. That, I think, is the great lesson for us to learn today. There is no reason for any believer to be afraid of demons or to adopt some superstition or spooky notion concerning Satan. If you feel that you are bothered with him, then just ask the Lord Jesus to deliver you. They have been cast out in his name. And it is a lack of faith in the Lord Jesus to walk in fear of them today. If you feel that they can control you in any way or possess you or direct you, then you need counseling. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has power over demons. The next miracle is closely connected with the miracle of the raising of the daughter of Jairus. Mark chapter 5 verse 21 onward. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at Jesus' feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hand on her so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because, she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Now Jesus had returned again to his land. In telling this incident, it is interesting that Luke, who was a physician, said that she could not be healed. Mark says that she had suffered many things of the physicians and she had spent all that she had. So we see that this matter of medical expenses being so great today is not new at all. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and he asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you? His disciples answered. And yet you ask, who touched me? The disciples thought it was a very peculiar question since the whole crowd was pressing in on Jesus. But only one touched him in faith for healing. 
the situation is the same today, isn't it? I think we have a lot of folk around who use the name of Jesus so freely. They are running around saying that it is Jesus this and Jesus that. And people think they certainly know him. Surely they know him. But they have touched him as the crowd touched him. Not like this woman touched him. For she touched him in faith for healing. Verse 32 we read, But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. She had been in this condition for 12 years. Did you notice that the little girl was 12 years old also? 12 years of suffering coming to an end and 12 years light entering into darkness, the darkness of death. The father who had come when he saw our Lord talking to this woman and dealing with her, I am sure thought, oh, why doesn't he hurry? Doesn't he know that my little girl is so sick at home that she'll die unless he moves? Our Lord purposefully did not move. He healed this woman and while he was dealing with her, one comes with a message which is whispered to the father. Listen to what the message was. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus the synagogue ruler, and said, Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher any more? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, Jesus took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. So Jesus goes to the home and puts out those who don't believe. When they were out, he goes in and the record tells us in verse 41, Jesus took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Now, Talitha kumi was an expression of the Aramaic that the little girl would have understood. It was a native tongue. And I think it could have been translated, Little lamb, wake up. That's what he said to her. And that is a sweet, loving thing to say. We find that our Lord raised a little girl. He raised a man in the vigor of young manhood, the widow's son at Nain, and then probably a mature man or even a senior citizen, Lazarus. He raised them all the same way. He spoke to them. Immediately, the little girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. Then Jesus gave strict orders not to tell anyone or let this to be known. And he told them to give her something to eat. Now, isn't that practical? If a 12-year-old girl or a 12-year-old boy for that matter were waked up from sleep and were made well, what would they want? Food, of course. So he told them to feed the little one. How practical this is and how wonderful it is. These are the three great miracles that to my judgment demonstrate the great message of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is God's servant with God's power. He is a man of action. And he has come not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Here we see Jesus 
in this chapter doing three wonderful miracles. He casts out demons from the man in Gadara. He heals the woman with an issue of blood. He raises this little 12-year-old daughter of Jairus. Now as we conclude, I believe there is an important lesson in all of this. And it is for us today to understand that Jesus is moved by our fears. He is moved by our needs. And that Jesus cares enough to show us the power of his love. The poor demon-possessed man, a resourceful religious leader, an anonymous woman with an embarrassing sickness, and even a dead young girl, all experience Jesus' wonder-working power. Welcome back, dear friends. I guess you are excited to have an omnipotent God, a God who can do the impossible and change situations for the better. Imagine yourself being freed from a demonic possession or being healed from a sickness that had afflicted you for 12 long years or one of your family members being raised from the dead. All these miracles call for days of celebration and a lifetime of gratitude. As we see people's lives being changed, the power of divine was moving through Jesus so that all eyes would see what he later told his disciples about himself and the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus was fully God, though he walked amongst men and felt their pain and sorrow. Nature could not stand against him. All physical and spiritual forces obeyed his command. It doesn't matter how many years one is eluded by health and wealth. We are talking about a being who can give life to the lifeless brothers and sisters. What is the struggle that is keeping you from having peace? Or is there a thing that has crushed your hope so badly that it is already dead and needed resurrection? If any of those are your situation, have you prayed for Jesus to visit you? Or do you know a friend or a neighbor who needs Jesus' touch of love and healing? God is right beside you, dear friend. Talk to Him and feel His grace. God bless you. Mm -hmm.